Um, so today we have Dr. Dietrich, um, who, as you all know, is the director of the Institute of Medical Medicine, um, pioneer in hep C research and uh, clinical care. Going to talk to us today about some updates in hepatitis. Uh, so. <laughs> Thanks, John. <Jim. laughs> yeah. Yeah, hep C research is over. <laughs> That's it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. We have lots of other stuff, but hep C is over. Um, but actually, before we go to hep C, I just want to remind everybody about hepatitis A um, epidemics across the U.S. here. New York is in light blue, but you, you, you know we've heard these restaurants. 7-Eleven closed in Nassau County, and then some taco place oh. in Westchester and New Jersey. It's like they're all over the place. So make sure you vaccinate everybody, <laughs> okay, for hepatitis A. Most of our patients have not been vaccinated. Uh, all our kids are getting vaccinated now, actually. So um, you don't have to be traveling to a tropical aisle to get hepatitis A, okay? Manhattan is a tropical aisle. You can get it at the dirty deli downstairs. Um, so vaccinate everybody for hepatitis A, please. It's embarrassing if they die of hepatitis A. Um, okay, so epidemiology. So you know, they also, everybody also said, oh, we, could, we cured hep C, now it's easy, no problem, you can retire. Well, yeah. Not quite, you know, it's like we've cured a, over a million people in the U.S., a million, million two, maybe. Um, and actually, all, and over three million worldwide. But the problem is there's more cases coming in than there are going out uh, because of this new incidence of hepatitis C starting uh, somewhere around 2010 here. And it's actually mostly uh, in non-metropolitan areas, and it's mostly driven by uh, opioid, IV drug use, you know, the, <clears throat> you know, the, the Percocet, et cetera, um, the Sackler School of Medicine epidemic. Um, anyway, so, um, and actually in, in New York, we have, we have different, slightly different numbers, but the highest incidence is in the under 30 uh, group in the non-metropolitan areas. So here were a few of the incidences here from before 2006 by 12, it looked like this. And you can see here, this is any opioid up here, um, there's regional doubling. Three out of four had a history of opioid use. So you all know that story about uh, OxyContin. We don't have to beat that dead horse. Uh, but the problem is also, it's actually in women uh, of childbearing age, uh, the number of acute cases increased about three and a half fold, uh, and the number of past or present cases doubled. Um, and it's higher than in the older women here, so um, age 15 to 44. So it's really, it's really sort of out of control, um, hepatitis C, in, in the younger age groups, largely due to the opioid um, epidemic. Uh, and it's actually higher in women than in men. So for some, it's about 63 or 4 percent female to male um, ratio, and it seems to be, for some reason, that younger women are way more susceptible to becoming addicted to opiates than, than younger men are. Uh, not entirely clear why that is, but it can take as little as five days. You know, for a sprained ankle, somebody gets an OxyContin prescription, and after five days, they're already addicted to it. They can't get a refill, and they go down to the mall, and they can get a bag of heroin for five bucks, which is cheaper than a latte um, at the mall, uh, and which will take care of their withdrawal symptoms. And then, of course, you know what, what happens from there. So this is in New York State. 2005 is just the baby boomers. By 2012, we, there was a baby bump here. We noticed the baby bump. Uh, by, by 2015, the bumps were equal. And now by 2016, in 2016, actually, as you can see here, actually, there's the, the, the under 30 crowd is much more, much more hepatitis C than the, um, than the baby boomers. But, it's, but this is only new cases. When they say right. total, it's new cases. And this is actually outside of New York yeah. City. So this is not the prevalence of Pepsi. This no, is the this is cases. incidence. Yeah. This is, this is incidence. Um, but, and it's actually outside of New York City. It's, it starts, we, we rarely see it inside the five boroughs. But the, but the minute you cross the Nassau County line uh, and you cross the Westchester County line and you cross the Hudson River, it just skyrockets, actually. It's just out of control. Um, 
So, um, and then of course, Tatiana's not, is Tat Tatiana's not here, is she today? I think she's roaming. Oh, right. Uh, she's at West. Plenty of seats up front here. Just like in church, you come in late, you got to sit up front. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, and the rates of hep C during pregnancy have also been increasing because the majority of the cases are in, in women of childbearing age. So, um, uh, that's that's kind of what we've been we've been working with Tatiana and and uh, Rhoda Sperling uh, from OB about uh, treating some of these pregnant women in the last two months of pregnancy or last three months of pregnancy. Um, we we were we had started actually to use uh, you know Harvoni um, because you know the uh, the original genotype was genotype one, but unfortunately the new epidemic in, the, in this under thirty crowd uh, the majority is geno three. So Harvoni wouldn't work, so we would need to use Efclusa, uh, which we didn't have a category. Harvoni is category B in pregnancy. We were going to use Efclusa. It doesn't have a category, uh, so we're waiting for some PK studies in, pregnancy, in pregnant women from Australia to, be, to, to start the study. They did finish the Harvoni study in Pittsburgh with about 10 patients or something, um, you know, treating months eight and nine in, in pregnancy, and it seems like it works. Obviously, good time to get women into therapy when they're pregnant. For one thing, they get automatic Medicaid if they're pregnant, if, they don't, if they're not insured. For another thing, women obviously are very concerned about their health while they're pregnant. They may not be after they um, give birth or start using IV drugs again. So, history of hepatitis C. Uh, the first uh, pub actually publication was in 1975 uh, in the Annals. Actually, it was the gold edition of the Annals where they called it non-A, non-B hepatitis. They still couldn't find it. Um, it wasn't actually until uh, 1989 that uh, Michael Houghton uh, did this antigen capture technique and was able to separate the virus from the antibody and, uh, and actually make, a, make a, a diagnostic antibody test. That's the Chiron people. But believe it or not, before we had the antibody test, we actually had an approval for interferon to treat um, to treat abnormal liver enzymes in patients who had presumed non-A, non-B hepatitis or chronic hepatitis on liver biopsy. So that's how blind we were treating, actually, with, uh, with, you know, with interferon. Um, they finally figured out some of the genome and by 93, the 3D structure um, here in 96, and they had an infectious clone uh, constructed here in the Replicon, it was in 1999. Problem was Chiron actually had a patent on the virus from 1989 until 1999, until somebody challenged them and actually won the battle. You can't patent the virus, just like you can't patent the human genome. Um, actually, but they were actually charging all these people money to try to do um, research on uh, on hepatitis C. So it slowed down the progress <laughs> quite a bit. Actually, because during this this period of time. Uh, HIV drugs were, you know, were running rampant, actually, the number of drugs, because they were able to do all those experiments. Nobody had patented HIV. Um, so by um, 98, we had added ribavirin to the um, um, mixture uh, and gotten some better results. We added PEG, and this actually brought the, well, interferon three million three times a week. So actually, there's some of the new fellows here. I should tell you this story. This is drug development 101. So how did interferon get into the liver world? So, so back in the uh, in the late 80s, uh, at the NIH, the NCIS, I'm not sorry, not the NCIS, that's the TV show, the National <laughs> Cancer, the NCI, <laughs> the National Cancer Institute. Um, uh, <laughs> that's a good one, though. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, the NCI had interferon. They were using it for melanoma. They were using 20 million units IV uh, seven days a week for um, um, for melanoma. And it was te obviously terrible side effects, you know, and the, the on oncologists were used to this. But, you know, so the, the uh, liver fellows, Hufnagel, Jay Hufnagel sent the fellows over, go talk to the oncology fellows, see, how, see how, what they're doing with this interferon and figure out how we can try it on this non-A, non-B hepatitis, because we think it's a virus. Um, so they talked to the oncology fellows and they said, well, here's two things you, you need to know. The side effects are terrible. Okay. And number, number two, um, I told Ben this story the other night. Um, number two, 
Um, the nurses re we refuse to administer the drug because it's so toxic and it's experimental. So you have to give the drug. The fellows have to administer the drug. So the, uh, the liver fellows, being smarter than the oncology fellows, said, OK, let's give a lower dose, 3 million units, and let's <laughs> give it sub Q so we don't have to start an IV, and let's give it Monday, Wednesday, Friday so we don't have to come in on the weekends and give the drug. <laughs> So that's how it started off, 3 million units three times a week, because the fellows were smart enough not to want to have to come in on the weekend and give, give these people their, their injections. So then they tried it for 12 weeks. It didn't work at all, actually. They said, all right, let's go a little longer. And went to 24 weeks. They got like a 5% response rate. So then they said, we better go for a year. Um, so we, uh, you know, they, they went a year, but then they said, um, well, we, we got to divide this up into quarters, right, because it's... Uh, you know, with, we want to have scientific progress, you know, reports, you know, every quarter. So, but the problem is, what's 52 divided by 4? 13. Bad luck. Can't have anything to the 13. And it actually, no one's ever going to respond. So they said, okay, let's do 48. Everyone knows the 12 times table, actually. So that's how it's, every, now all of our hepatitis treatments are 12, 24, 48 weeks. So basically, the, the, this treatment was given for 10 or 15 years based on the fact that fellows didn't want to come in on the weekends and the time it took the Earth to circle the sun, minus four weeks, because 13 is bad luck. Okay, scientific drug development at its finest. Um, we're all glad to be rid of interferon. Um, I think, oops, sorry. Um, so actually, and. Uh, 2011 was a big year because um, actually in April of that year in Barcelona, we saw the first presentation of an all oral uh, cure of, of hepatitis C. It was asanapravir and um, the cladosphere together. Uh, the BMS, two BMS drugs, asanapravir was a protease that never got approved. Uh, the cladosphere got approved, but it was 30% SVR. But it was no interferon, no ribavirin, so a proof of principle you could cure hep C without um, interferon or ribavirin. So that was a big deal. But the really big deal was six months later in November in San Francisco when Ed Gain presented the soft uh, interferon ribavirin data from, um, from Christchurch, New Zealand, actually where, and so he, he had like a forearm study <coughs> because no one was sure exactly what they were doing. So they had sofosbuvir, uh, interferon, ribavirin for 12 weeks. These are these were genome twos and threes in his study. And so 12 weeks of triple therapy was 100% cure. And then they had eight weeks of triple therapy, four weeks of soft riba, 100% cure. Then four weeks of triple therapy, eight weeks of soft riba, 100% cure. And then like, wait for it, 12 weeks of soft riba alone, cure rate was 100%, actually. So there were audible gasps in the room people were dropping their booklets, and the investors running for the phones, actually out in the hallway, to buy Pharmacet stock, because this drug looked so good. It turned out it was. It still is. Um, there's no other really nuke on the market that, that, that works that well. Now, that was in April here. Uh, May, Tilaprevir and Bosaprevir got approved, the first two protease inhibitors, but those, those were used with interferon, um, actually, and they were terrible. It was, they made our lives really miserable. Um, actually, the side effects were much worse, and the cure rates in the real world um, had dropped from the, the clinical trials numbers of 70% to about 40%. So it was really dismal response in, in the real world, and the side effects were just out of control. Um, they, were, they were exponentially worse than uh, interferon and ribavirin. So, Actually, um, in December, sorry, in December of, um, of, of 2011, actually, uh, Gilead announced that they had uh, bought the uh, uh, Pharmacet, so Pospavir, for $11 billion. A lot of 11s going on here. So they closed the deal in February. Okay, by the following December, not, not quite two years later, December of 2013, we were at the FDA with sofosbuvir, actually, and simiprevir, which is another protease, which is also now off the market. And then, actually, both got approved the same day. So, in that, so 2012 started the day, the year of all oral therapy, because of the Cosmos 
trial, which we're, where we, 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 we looked at soft and SimSoft, Simiprivir, Sim, Sofosbuvir, with or without ribavirin. And that's pretty much all we used. The insurance companies didn't fight us on that. They called us and said, please do this, because they, they, they saw all the interferon, telaprevir, emergency and room admissions, uh, right, transfusions, et cetera, et cetera. So we used SimSoft until uh, December of 2013, actually when Harmony was first approved. And then so 2014 was really the, the start of the all oral uh, direct acting antiviral therapies. So soft riba <coughs> here. Uh, January 13, SimSoft, and then soft Ocladosphere, soft Ladiposphere. This is Harvoni in November of 2014, and this is uh, the Vicara pack from from Abvi. Uh, this is uh, Zepatir here, and um, this is Epclusa, and then this is um, Bosevi over here, and then this is um, the uh, GP from Abvi here. Pretty much, these are the only three drugs you need to know. So forget about all the rest of that. <laughs> That's just history. <clears throat> and I think this is, the, this is our mantra, actually, in the world. Even the ASLD guidelines, which usually really stink, um, actually got this one right. Finally, the first time out, they, they really blew it, actually, because they, they told us to triage patients um, to only stage 3 and stage 4 disease. And the insurance companies interpreted that. We, ASLD did it because of triage, because they thought we'd be overwhelmed with all patients with hepatitis C. So they said triage, treat the stage three and stage four as first. All the insurance companies said, see, you don't have to treat any, anybody else but stage three and stage four. So that was a big battle for the first few years. Finally, actually, New York State and about half the other states, there are no longer fibrosis requirements to, um, to treat. Um, so all major international guidelines now, EASL, ASLD, and the World Health Organization, Treatment considered without delay in patients at risk, even at risk of transmitting, including PWIDs, people who inject drugs. Um, and they're, they're safe and effective in people using opioid substitution history, uh, opioid substitution therapy, even in those with a history of injecting drug use or have actually 50% of people on opioid substitution <coughs> are using other drugs than the opiates that they're being substituted with. So I put this up front because this is not really part sort of the simplified guidelines, but it's something that everybody should know. Uh, along with, with testing everybody for hepatitis A antibody and vaccinating them if they're negative, you have to screen everybody for hepatitis B. And you've got to screen for all three tests. This is the way the CDC said you got to know all these three, all these three things. S antigen, <laughs> S antibody, and core antibody, all three, because it's really important. They're all negative, vaccinate. If the S antigen is positive and they have DNA, you've got to treat, forget about, forget about this meeting AASLD guidelines, just treat the hepatitis B. So put them on a nuke, you know, the TAF, tenofovir, or entecavir. Um, if the S antigen is positive, it, 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 th th this part is silly. So if the S antigen is positive and then they have DNA, treat them because there's a risk of reactivation. Uh, if their S antigen is negative and their core positive, this I think most people would suggest that uh, you could do a DNA once um, on, on these people and then actually monitor them carefully during treatment. So why this is, is because there was a report um, <clears throat> to the FDA for about 19 patients that the FDA actually had, had submitted and published to ASLD a few years ago on reactivation of hepatitis B. Some of them were just core positive. Some of them were S antigen positive, and some of them were uh, actually DNA positive as well, and many of them were not tested for hepatitis B. But 19 of them had developed serious fulminant hep hep hepatitis B. Uh, I think nine of them died or got transplants. It was a very serious you know, issue in these folks because people didn't pick it up until late. So and, and it's a very simple reason. Actually, the hepatocyte is only capable of making one virus efficiently at a time. So if you, and hep C usually seems to dominate. So if you've got 5 million IUs of hepatitis C uh, <clears throat> being produced by your local hepatocytes, uh, and you have 500 IUs of hep B, when you suddenly take away the hepatitis C, which actually these DAAs do in a week, actually almost everybody is undetectable, all of a sudden hepatitis B can flourish and blossom, actually, and can result in a flare, actually, or fulminant liver failure, which it did in you know, nine of these 
19 patients. So hence this. So I think if the S antigen is positive, check the DNA. DNA is positive, put them on heavy medication. You know, it doesn't have to be the same time. It doesn't reactivate quickly, but you just, you know, start the process. It'll take the same, it'll take about the same amount of time. So these are the requirements. We must have SBR. We must have safety and tolerability. We have all that, actually. Uh, and we pretty much have all this now as well. We still have some drug interactions. Um, it's nice to have a low pill burden as well. So the World Health Organization wants us to eliminate hepatitis C globally by 2030. Um, it's a tall order, actually. I don't think we're going to make that one. Um, so um, everybody's trying to simplify the, the route to a cure, um, actually, and then think about these things. We'll minimize the burden on both the clinician and the patient because everybody with hepatitis C doesn't need to be treated at an academic medical center by a highly educated, <laughs> underpaid hepatologist. Um, so, like I said before, these are the only three drugs you need to, you need to know about. Uh, Softvel, GP, and uh, Softvel Vox. Here, because these other ones are really not, uh, frankly, useful anymore. They're giving this stuff away uh, in the developing world. Um, <clears throat> this is it in pictures. If you like pictures, Softvel for 12 weeks. Um, pretty much for everybody. It's pangenotypic, and you can use it in child's B and C patients. Uh, with uh, probably with ribavirin uh, if they have uh, Geno3 for certain. This is, this is GP for 8, 12, or 16 weeks. This is three pills, once a day. This is one pill once a day. And it's all, all good numbers here as well, but you can't use it in patients with, who have child's B or C um, um, uh, cirrhosis because GP, any, any, any protease inhibitor actually, um, uh, the glucaprovir, um, so we should probably go back a second, right? So a buvir is a nuke, okay? An asvir is an NS5A, and a provir is a protease. So any, all proteases are metabolized in the liver, so, which is why you don't want to use them in patients with child's B or C, because the levels can go up and you can get toxicity, um, <clears throat> actually uh, for, you know, liver toxicity for the, uh, from, the, you know, from the medication. Actually, um, AbbVie is just about to get an indication for child's A cirrhosis uh, here uh, for, this, for the study. It's actually a little bit, it was 100% in the clinical trial. And actually, that's probably because of the same reason. The levels go up a little bit. Uh, and you know, the, if your liver function is not that great, the actual function, not the ALT, uh, because it's metabolized, so you get higher levels of the drug in the liver, probably get a little bit higher SDR rate. That's for child's A. B and C, it's unpredictable, so probably don't use protease inhibitors. And the same thing would go for soft melt box. <clears throat> so this is, this, is, this is more pictures. Um, and then fibrosis staging. Uh, actually, stage three or stage four fibrosis requires, for now at least, lifelong screening uh, for HCC. Uh, and we don't, like I said, we don't know about this. So some people now, I've just finally heard some of our colleagues are actually stopping screening for F3s. Uh, if, they, if their fiber scans are all, all the way back to zero, I'm not quite that confident yet to do that um, because we still see HCCs, you know, a long time after, after the cure, um, particularly when they get lost to follow-up. So um, I, think, I think Lorraine sent this out to you. Actually, we, we got together to put together this simplified algorithm. This is really not for, um, you know, specialists. This is for, you know, treaters out there. So they can help us out and treat the easy ones, and then send us the send us the hard ones. So this is so we can the world we can meet this this guideline here of uh, 2030. Oops, wrong button. Um, so we had a consensus meeting. We actually there was honestly very little fighting, um, <laughs> surprisingly enough, um, amongst and between. 13 experts, that's an unlucky number, I guess. We should have thought about that. I think one was on the phone. Flan was on the phone from Chicago. Uh, <laughs> so this is the illustrious group here uh, from, uh, from the US, and we had two, um, two token Europeans um, there as, as well. So how, how can we make this simple? You've got the virus, actually. So remember, all of our antibody tests now are antibody with reflex to PCR, no longer the healthcare system can you order just a plain hep C antibody. It's antibody reflux 
reflex to PCR. Reflux is what I've got right now. <laughs> um, let me take a drink. Uh, okay. Then, then, then the usual stuff. Here, to make it easy for the primary care folks, there's, a, there's two magic numbers here for platelets, 150. Okay, then they really need to be uh, assessed for cirrhosis. 100, if they're less than 100, then they need to be uh, in the hands of an experienced liver treater because they have portal hypertension. And so that even if they don't have access to sophisticated fibrosis testing, that everybody can get a platelet count. So it, 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 it's pretty much the poor man's liver biopsy, <clears throat> so it's very helpful. And then assess for uh, for drug-drug um, interactions, uh, and then and then they can go either way. It doesn't really matter um, if they have cirrhosis, you know, B or C. Well, you shouldn't be doing this at home anyway. Uh, they should be sending them in, but uh, don't use GP if they have S, if they have a GF, GFR less than 15 or actually uh, officially 30. But a lot of people are going lower than that. Then 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 the recommendation is to use GP. So bad liver. Use soft valve, bad kidneys, use GP. Other than that, it's pretty simple. Um, and that's what we're trying to, trying, trying to make it. <clears throat> so we also recommended actually universal screening. Uh, this one we did argue about. Some people wanted to stick with risk factor screening, but nobody admits to these risk factors anyway. Um, so I think universal screening is really actually a, most, a, a reasonable thing. I mean, frankly, everybody should be screened for hepatitis A, B, and C and vaccinated for A and B if they don't have it, and treated for Hep C if they have it. Um, so it, it's relatively easy. Uh, if they have an active infection, uh, we, we, we don't even have to get the genotype. Okay, we, we, we left out genotypes. With, with these two drugs, it doesn't matter, actually. I mean, we get it for curiosity's sake, but you know, we always do it. Uh, but if you're doing this out in the developing world where the genotype test, it costs at least as much as like half of the therapy, um, then it's probably not necessary to, you know, to do it. And then, and then the usual things that we, that we talk about here, um, use pangenotypic therapy, and then um, assess for cure, unless, of course, they have those, any one of those hepatitis B markers that, you know, that we talked about, and then they're cured. And then we talk about post-cure management. So uh, <clears throat> no cirrhosis for Sobvel, 12 weeks, uh, GP, 8 and 12, uh, and that's not indicated in decompensated cirrhosis. One tablet a day with or without food, once daily. Three tablets a day with food. Um, although this one has actually got really good packaging. Um, the GP, it's got idiot proof, push, push through packaging. So the, the three pills come in a box, which is sort of good news and bad news. The, the, G, the, the soft bell comes in a bottle. So if, so if the, the GP comes in a box of 30 like dose packs, so it's kind of awkward. It's kind of big. So if people, if some people have uh, sort of limited housing options, let us say. Um, you know, if they're living at the corner of walk and don't walk, okay, it's harder to carry around a big box of GP. You have to sort of consider those, those kind of options. Or if they're living in a shelter, for instance, or, you know, something. It's common side effects, pretty much nothing, um, actually, here. I don't, has anybody not had any of these in the last week? <laughs> Except for, I don't know, about asthenia. I still can't figure out what asthenia means. Anybody, anybody had asthenia? Can they explain it to us? <laughs> anybody calling sick with a severe case of asthenia recently? <laughs> anyway, most patients feel better. Pretty, sometimes the first week on therapy, they might complain about some of this stuff, but... Uh, actually, and the, uh, the other thing that's a little shocking is some patients are still reading the interferon side effects in, on the internet. So they think they're going to get these terrible side effects, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, like right away. <laughs> it's like you really have to educate them because they're, they're just like lost. We had one come in last week who was referred 10 years ago. And it just took her a little while to get in. Uh, and because uh, she was worried about those interferon side effects. We haven't had interferon side effects for six years. Um, actually, unfortunately, her platelets were 73. That means she already had, you know, fiber scan was like 35. So she's already on the borderline of decompensation um, <clears throat> by the time we got her. So drug-drug interactions here. Um, most of the anticonvulsants. Keppra is the one that's safe if you can get your... Um, neurologist to switch to Keppra. 
Um, that, that actually will work. Rifampin, nobody uses efavirenz anymore. Tell them to stop all the herbs and spices. Okay, don't, don't take anything over the counter except for Tylenol or vitamin D. Um, PPIs are sort of optional. You can work around it. You can take 20 of omeprazole at the same time as the soft veil if you need to. And statins, uh, all but pravastatin are a problem. You're, so you can always stop the statins for three months or two months over here for GP if you want, or you can switch to the, to the, the statin that doesn't have the, um, the drug drug interaction. What's the nature of the proton uh, the the NS5As the, um, uh, the uh, don't don't get absorbed well uh, in a non-acid milieu. Uh, um, and here with GP, uh, it's pretty much the same list, um, except that the big one is ethanol estradiol containing contraceptives. So that there's a lot of women on on those kind of contraceptives nowadays. So obviously there's a lot of other choices for contraception, but you have to keep that in mind because uh, actually it'll lower the uh, um, the um, effect, effectiveness of the of the glucaprevir. Uh, uh, Adazanavir not being used much anymore, nor is ritonavir. Statins and cyclosporin is something here, um, and these are the usual things that are, don't have any problems. Um, so this is particularly they have B patients. If they have any symptoms, come in at least 12 weeks after, after com treatment completion, confirm cure. In the real world, I mean, in, in, in our shop, we see them usually at week four into treatment just to make sure there's no problems. And then we see them at SVR4, SVR12, SVR24, SVR48. Um, uh, then we'll frequently, depending on their, what their fibrosis stage was coming in, then we'll just tell them once a year, um, uh, basically as a checkup. Uh, if they're F2 or we, we don't do, um, ultrasounds anymore. If they're F3 or F4, we will continue to do ultrasounds. If their cirrhosis is worse than, than that, we'll do, we'll do MRIs alternating with ultrasounds because the ultrasound is not that good a test. Um, now, one thing is you got to tell them, okay, even though you're cured now, you can get this again, okay? If you go out and do the things you did that likely got you this medication, we're not asking what you did or who you did it with. Or it doesn't matter, but okay, you can get it again. Uh, and there's lots of people who do. Although it's actually not the usual people that people people worry about. Um, so talk about harm reduction resources, get them into opioid substitution uh, therapy treatment if you can, and continue uh, HCC surveillance in anybody who had F3 or F4. Pretty simple. Yeah. yeah. For people in the community for this guidelines that are written for, you talk about the you know screen for cirrhosis and platelets, but is there like a fibrosis assessment through the big? Yeah, like yeah, we 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 uh, yeah we uh, we make yeah we, whichever one they can uh, they have available. Actually, it's listed and I think in a table in there. So in terms of reinfection rates, there's a couple of studies uh, here actually. Low risk patients who had no 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 apparent risk factors before, perhaps he's about one percent. Um, and this is eleven thousand patients. This is high risk. Patients who were using IV drug users or, or prisoners, about 13. And this is actually the co-infected patients. It's between 20 and 25% reinfection rate. Um, so that's, that's huge. This is where we see most of our reinfections. Uh, <clears throat> actually, so this is HIV-infected male partners with a, with a telaprevir-resistant hep C. Um, so you can track the, the virus, the infection rates by, um, and they've done this all over Europe. This actually started, the epi this, this, this epidemic started in London, um, actually with 44 genotype 4 patients about five years ago. And they, they were able to track the viruses actually all over Europe, you know, London, Amsterdam, Berlin, Paris, and then now they're in New York, San Francisco, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because unsafe sex is returned um, pre, uh, as in the pre-HIV pre epidemic. Uh, so, and actually, so HIV positive, Patients are highly likely to get reinfected, as are HIV negative ones who are on PrEP. PrEP is so uh, common nowadays, particularly in New York, that a lot of people are taking Truvada for PrEP. Um, and so those are the folks that um, you can't, they can't get HIV, they can't get hepatitis B, but they can get hepatitis C, they can get LGV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Syphilis epidemic is at an all-time high. Uh, actually, in New York now, um, 
Dr. Mullen's nurse, Daisy, has got carpal tunnel syndrome from the penicillin injections she's doing all the time. <laughs> actually, and there's a lot of repeat offenders because you can get syphilis again as well. Actually, not it's not a not a one time not a one time thing. So um, people people who inject drugs despite imperfect adherence, SBR rates actually are um, high 90s. Actually, pretty much uh, uh, here 90 percent. Even the even in these people who finish late. Allison, we, we ever had anybody who come in uh, after 12 weeks and said, Doc, I got a few pills left over. <laughs> I get it. It's like, yeah, I got about half a bottle left over here <laughs> after 12 weeks. It's like, well, just. We also have some pretty lucky cases of patients who have allergic reactions only go three weeks, four weeks, yeah, weeks. Stop. Yeah. Been cured, so don't them right yeah. Stop. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't rush into retreatment. Actually, you may actually cure them with a short with a short course. Although actually, uh, when, when when we had dosed, our, you know, our liver, our hepatitis fellow a few years ago, look at our first five thousand patients. The, um, the the number one reason for failure with a hazard ratio of twenty was actually failure to receive their second uh, month's medication on time from the pharmacy. Um, actually, second was with a hazard ratio of of two was actually a male sex and then um, black black race. Actually, so ten times less, ten times smaller hazard ratio for those things than than lack of shipping by the uh, by the pharmacy due to the insurance company. So this this just came out in in, in hepatology, actually, um, sick about almost seven thousand patients here, uh, and actually the main reinfection rate here younger patients uh, uh, were uh, much more likely to get reinfected than older ones. And recent IV drug use, a remote IV drug use, and then never IV drug use. So this is from the, the Merck clinical trials, actually in terms of reinfections. This is an all opioid substitution um, uh, study, actually. Uh, it was 10 reinfections, so it was about 1.8 reinfections per 100 person years, which is low. It's really low. So it, this should not stop anybody from getting treated. But there's a lot of folks out in the community who think this, you know, they should, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, <clears throat> um, so drug use stable over time does not change with SVR, and then more reinfections are early um, here. <clears throat> so in the transplant world with Hep C, more and more Hep C positive organs are being used here, um, as you can see, um, with similar outcomes uh, here in terms of survival. Uh, and those with people that want un uninfected organs at one and two years. And obviously the wait is shorter, although I hear, Jim, it's not that much shorter anymore. For, and it, for kidney, it's still, for like, kidney, it's for still about the same. At least in <clears throat> But actually, um, we, have, we do have this to the, um, to, we, we do have the opioid epidemic to thank for this, actually, because all these young folks under 30 who o die of overdoses have all signed their donor cards on their driver's licenses. So, um, so we get their livers and their kidneys in, uh, in large supply. Hence, the, our transplant numbers are up about 50% of the last couple years. Um, and then this is relatively new, still controversial in some places. Uh, hep C positive donors to Hep C negative recipients. This is hearts. Actually, it drops the, um, drops the wait time. Um, Dramatically for hearts, this is 500 days. This is about a year. This is only a, only a couple of weeks actually. Um, so those young folks have got good hearts too. Actually, you want those. You want those hearts. Um, so they're they're using GP for eight weeks on call to the OR. Actually, two out of 25 patients, uh, there was no viremia actually, and the similar results to uh, at, at at Vanderbilt. They did it for lungs as well, and they had two of eight who got soft vel here um, relapse. One with high level resistance, and um, and on, one actually with early fibrosis and cholestatic hepatitis. <clears throat> so generally good outcomes, but lung and heart have always been more challenging. Delayed start to antiviral therapy um, is the is the problem here. Uh, promising, but needs to be done carefully. So <clears throat> they may want to start <coughs> start treatment in the um, in the recipients maybe slightly before on call to the OR. Maybe get you know get them a couple days to get drug levels up because when they're not going to be able to get it through the NG tube post uh, post op etc. 
So drug interactions are really important. Um, you know, to look at, at drug interactions will be an epic. But if you don't know, actually go to the Liverpool website, www.hepcdruginteractions.org. Uh, they've been doing HIV drug interactions for like 30 years. They're, they're really good at it. Um, and they, um, they just started with, um, actually they've, done, they've been doing hep C stuff for like five years. They just started uh, adding, uh, adding the new fatty liver drugs, the new experimental fatty liver drugs to their, uh, their database after we spoke to them um, at, at, at Easel. These guys are really good um, because they don't wait for a placebo controlled trial to actually tell you about an interaction. If, they, if there's no actual study looking at it, they'll guess, actually, which is a good thing. You know, you really want them to do that because if this, you know, if this is a P450 drug and this is a P450 drug, you're going to have a problem. If this is not a P450 drug, you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, you may be no published data, but <clears throat> at least they, they, you know, they'll, they'll take, a, they'll take a, um, an educated guess that it should not be a problem. So these guys are really good. And if there's something that's not on there, <clears throat> and you really need to know, let me know. Okay, I, ha I have David Back's email. He usually gets back to me within about six hours. Um, and he, he polls his, his team, even if there's no data on it, and they, and they, and they make a simple wild ass guess, okay, as to whether uh, you'll have a drug interaction or not. Um, yeah, the swag method. Yeah, we do that a lot, actually. Uh, <laughs> so unlike Telaprevir, Bosaprevir, real world evidence, um, is, um, is much better for our, our newer drugs, the GP and the Softvel. It's, it's almost 100% here. It's actually slightly better in the real world than in the clinical trials. Um, probably because real world evidence, we, we kind of knock off a few of the patients uh, you know, if, if they don't comply. This is the, the safety eff efficacy and the patient reported outcomes. So in terms <laughs> of um, actually their SF36 is the quality of life in these patients actually increases um, uh, dramatically, and it's had a significant FX, F, SF36 component score improvements. So in, in the UK, they did this study, or maybe this is just England. It may, it may just be England soon, no longer the UK. Um, um, genotype 3, um, actually, they did notice that ribavirin improves response, in, particularly in cirrhotic patients. Most of us, actually, any, any, any geno 3, with cirrhosis, with or without cirrhosis, we probably would use um, ribavirin, or if they had new significant fibrosis uh, <clears throat> in these folks. Um, here, so it was significantly better. <clears throat> um, and it's 5A resistance profile, and it impacts outcome of retreatment, actually very little. Uh, <clears throat> but um, if you failed, Honestly, the only only resistance mutations you have to worry about, <coughs> excuse me, are are the um, are the NS5A resistance mutations. Protease resistance mutations fade away uh, after like six to nine months in almost everybody, but the NS5A resistance mutations are forever. They will they will hang around a, a lot. So if they've only failed soft riba, or they've only failed telaprevir, bosaprevir, you don't have to worry actually. But if they failed an NS5A containing regimen, then you really have to check uh, if it's genotype one or three, you could get resistance testing. If it's two, four, five, or six, you can't. So only mostly on genome ones as is, is we see this. Now, one of the things <clears throat> about failures is to keep in mind, and this is the advanced course. So <clears throat> we had one guy, for instance, fail. He was a genome two. <clears throat> uh, he was a little cirrhotic. And we gave him soft riba back in the day when that was the treatment, uh, and he uh, he relapsed right away. Made me worry. I I rechecked his genotype actually, and the genotype came back um, as a as a chimera. Actually, it was part geno one and part geno two. That seems to be the most common chimeric form of one and two seem to be able to recombine um, in the in the hepatocyte, whereas you, you never see a chimera with threes and fours or or sixes. Uh, so if they fail, re recheck the genotype because that, that's, that's one, one way they could fail. So when, he, when we did it and then we treated him for geno 1, <clears throat> he was fine. He's cured of that anyway, not so much the, the colon cancer. Um, 
and so for instance, there was another guy who came in, failed Zepatir. Um, <clears throat> this is this is a Grasobavir or Elbasvir here. Uh, and um, uh, he came in from Brooklyn somewhere anyway. So I rechecked his genotype <clears throat> and he had genotype three, actually. So either but and I saw the report, they sent him in with a geno one when he started. So <clears throat> either he got reinfected with a geno three or he actually had a, had two viruses. It's quite possible these people have more than one risk factor. So many times they'll have more than one uh, genotype of virus, but one will dominate. Just like the hep C dominates the hep B, one, one genotype will usually be predominant. We don't have to worry about that anymore if we're using SOFVEL or GP because they're all pan-genotypic, so we should be okay. Um, and, but if we do have ns 5 resistance mutations, you really need to add um, that third drug, the protease inhibitor, voxelaprevir, to SOFVEL. And actually, so far, uh, our voxelaprevir data, Ben, and you looked at it, we've had 25 patients. About, yeah, about. I think we're 100%, right? Knock on wood. I think it's 100% SVR, actually, for failures treated with voxelaprevir. If they have cirrhosis, then there's a whole different discussion to have. Uh, child B or C cirrhosis. Okay, guess what? Weird viruses are appearing in Africa. Is anybody shocked? Genotypes 1U, <laughs> 2X. Uh, actually, so I don't, this, why is Africa the, you know, like the, the, the home of viruses? I don't know, but there are weird ones popping up all over Africa. Actually, they're not as responsive to um, our typical um, uh, therapies. One final reminder here, you cure the hep C, you don't always get rid of the risk for HCC. Okay, the risk remains, but it's a much lower, actually. And this is in people who had um, stage three and stage four disease. So keep screening, you know, probably forever for as long as we know, actually, for, uh, we know now. Anyway, so liver transplants are falling for hep C here. Interferon PIs in the DAA era, it's dramatically dropping here. This is the Europeans, uh, actually really dropping there because they didn't have as many barriers to treatment in Europe as we did because of uh, red state Medicaid's not paying for um, hep C treatment. Um, <clears throat> And so, uh, and of course, in the, in the U.S., of course, uh, liver transplants for NASH are, are on the way up. They're, they're headed north. Not so much in Europe, you know, why those French women can't get fat. Okay, so um, screen for hepatitis B. If they're S antigen positive or DNA positive, treat. treat. Treat the hepatitis B as well. Vaccinate for hepatitis A and B. By the way, the new hepatitis B vaccine is fantastic. Heplasav. Two shots, one month apart, like 98% response rate. So we actually, we've been giving now just Hep A and B at the same time on the second visit, basically, the, the Hep A and the Hep B together, because we don't forget about it. Actually, the problem with the, the old-fashioned three-dose, you know, the six-month visit is about 50% of people didn't show up for that third dose of Hep B or the third dose of Twinrix. This way, we get them while they're still thinking about it, actually, and the Hep A vaccine almost never fails. Um, so it's really, it's actually, I think it's a much more efficient way to uh, give the vaccine. Genesis patients like it, yeah. but they don't forget to come in either, right? After one month, they, they can remember a month. Six months is like another century for, for most of our patients. <clears throat> so if, if we got a fiber scan of higher than uh, 9.5, then they need to be screened for life. That's an F3. 12.5 needs screening for varices, actually, or 20. Uh, on the fiber scan or platelets less than 100, depending on whose number you look at. No protease inhibitors in child B or C. Um, do use a combination with a nuke, and don't forget about ribavirin and cirrhotics, particularly genome three cirrhotics. And you can get it again. Um, continue to screen for HCV RNA, not antibody, of course. You know that, okay, still people, we still have people coming in with tears on their Quest lab slip from Connecticut, okay, with positive antibody tests. You know, five years after, uh, right, Maria? You've yeah. seen that, yeah. It's like we see it at least three or four times a year now. Less, we used to see it once a month. But you know, their internist in Connecticut says you can't be cured of Hep C. I'll prove it to you, and they do an antibody test because it's positive. And I feel like it's like, well, now they have to come in, and you know, between the tears, we get them blood, and you know, we and, and, and we cure them again, actually, by drawing their blood. Uh, 
<laughs> and so te tell them they'll test Hep C antibody for life. So the life insurance guys will never want them, nor will the blood bank people ever want them. Okay, although we can actually write some letters for their life insurance people uh, that they don't have Hep C anymore, and we can usually prove that to them. But they have with a with a negative PCR. So it's very curable. Lots of combinations. You really only need to know those three. Costs are really not an obstacle anymore. It's it's actually now. $24,000 for either uh, eight weeks of GP or 12 weeks of soft belt, actually, uh, with, you know, with the certified generic soft belt. Uh, don't forget about HCC screening. This makes us crazy. We've got a lady, lost her insurance, didn't come back for two years, 12 centimeter HCC. If this woman is like, it's, it's like, un, she's got like a complete response to Nevo. Actually, taste and Nevo, and it's like she's got no detectable tumor. It's like NED. It's a it's a miracle. <laughs> Actually, it's a miracle. Uh, she's one of those Nevo, you know, um, super responders. Um, so actually, our biggest problem now is getting them in. We actually have a, over 30,000 names in Epic that have uh, ICD-10 codes for hepatitis C. We've only treated about 6,000 of those. Um, so we're, we have uh, honeys. On these navigators and coordinators trying to track down all those folks and get them in. We have <clears throat> instituted opt-out screening in the uh, Beth Israel um, emergency room, which is bringing some patients to Amreen's clinic directly. Um, we, uh, and we're actually talking to our inpatient alcohol drug rehab people about getting referrals from them before they leave the hospital. So we're trying our best to track down the folks that we have in the building first before we could do outreach, but we are still doing some screening programs through the home of the home group as well. Okay, that's it. We got some time for questions if anybody has it. Um, Dr. <coughs> is, the, is there any data now for acute C cases, especially in the high risk patients? Uh, just treat them. Yeah. So just treat them. <laughs> yeah, there's no uh, there's no reason to wait. If they're HIV in particular, then they're never going to clear. Um, you know, if they're HIV negative, um, honestly, there's no reason, reason reason to wait. I mean, you can do IL-28B testing if you want, uh, which th then tells you they got about a 65, 70% chance of a cure if they're CC. But, um, I, I, you know, I think most people would rather just be treated. If they're in a high-risk group, it's you're also treating the population viral load. So they do this in the HIV world, to, particularly if they're in the MSM population. You know, they're going to go to more parties between now and the time, and six months. You know, and if they're going to share their hepatitis C with many other men. So uh, it's probably behooves us to just treat it. I mean, I would you make sure you have two positive PCRs. You know, always before you you know make any treatment decision. But yeah, I, I would just treat. It. Yeah, it's it's the best, easiest, the best way, population wise. And we never get any um, pushback from insurance, actually. Not so, not yet, anyway. Yes, sir. So you think you need to pop up in Africa to see if there's a problem? Well, only in Africa so far, you know. Um, so far, but. Yeah, I know. HIV started there, too. I know. That's sort of a little worry, of, you know, in the back of our little. We got enough problems right here. Um, you know, with, with what we have now, trying to find them and treat them, and eradicate that seed. But yeah, potentially it could be, actually. It gets into the flight attendants, you know, it's like, and you know, they go to the parties here in New York, and Berlin, and London, and Paris. And <laughs> we can see those genotypes up on that board, too, actually, yeah. yeah. How resistant are they? Well, the SBR rates were in the uh, 70s and 80s. Actually, uh, but I'm not sure what combos they were treatment combos they were using because they've been. Oh, they marked soft rather than combos because those are the ones that have been given to them the cheapest. Right, the cheapest. Or some of them, they're yes. Using those, so some are using soft them. sim still because they're giving away all yeah. the simipravir because nobody could, nobody wants it. Actually, yeah. So, so the, it depends on the treatment regimens, but they were, yeah, they were 70 to 80 percent. So we don't really know if they're with ideal regimens, you know, what they would respond to. Yeah. But thank you. I mean, it's like it's the it's the it's the you know the 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 uh, generics from India or the surplus drugs that they're that they're getting. My question about um, 
So are there data to show that since the advent of PrEP, there's been an increase in incidence in FC among like MSM or other sort of high risk populations like that? Well, the HIV positive, you know, MSM, yes, it's clear. And, and the H, HIV negative ones, yes, it's starting. Okay. It's like starting. Any, like from pre-PrEP to post-PrEP has there been? Yeah. Yeah, just like the ST, STIs right. have increased dramatically. Yeah. Public, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's very widely seen. It's on TV all the time, right? So it's sort of like. Uh, yeah. I. 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 I.